the realization that if everybody's waiting for things to get back to normal, um, or at least the way they used to be, they aren't. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. Not everybody's going to survive this. But a lot of companies are going to get stronger. Hi all, welcome to Engar DCX. I am Drishti and today we have the pleasure of welcoming David Avrin to our interview series. Let's begin with just a quick introduction of Engarty. Engarty is the world's leading no-code chatbot platform available across 14 channels with 30,000 bots created across 186 countries in every domain and use case. Engarty has also been recognized as a top platform by inc.com, tech world, CIO and many others. We run the Engarty blog, video channel and the Engarty CX podcast, receiving upwards of 300,000 visitors annually. And now for our guest, David Avril is one of the most in-demand customer experience and marketing keynote speakers and consultants in the world today. He delivers profound wisdom to clients and audience around the world. David is the author of the celebrated marketing books, It's Not Who You Know, It's Who Knows You, and Visibility Marketing. His latest customer experience book, Why Customers Leave and How to Win Them Back, was named by Forbes as one of the seven best books entrepreneurs need to read. So hi, David. We are really happy to have you on Ingarty. Thank you for having me. So I would like to begin with the very first question that I have, that what is um, more important? Like, is customer retention more important than customer acquisition? That's a great question. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time as business owners, entrepreneurs, staff in acquiring new customers. I mean, that's always really important, but we know, and the science has shown very clearly over the years that retaining a customer costs a lot less than attracting a new one. But, but unfortunately organizations, they put so many resources towards the acquisition side, the highest paid people in organizations oftentimes are the salespeople, the account executives and others. But once someone is a customer, we assume that they'll be fine. And so retention is so important and it's so under uh, appreciated and it's, there, there's less of a focus within organizations. And so that's what drove my book, Why Customers Leave and How to Win Them Back, was right. the recognition that we spend so much time and money attracting new customers mm -hmm. and then we frustrate them for some reason, whether it's putting them on hold for too long or making it very complicated to do business or making it hard to reach somebody. Um, and so what I really we talk about a lot is what do we do to, to be remarkably easy to do business with? We're in a very challenging time in the world with the pandemic and otherwise um, there's this shock to loyalty. Mm. Uh, it's not that loyalty is dead. It's just harder to earn and it's harder yeah. to keep because it's really easy to leave companies. And so retention is incredibly, it's so much more cost effective. And so one of the biggest complaints, it's hard to get answers. Right. And so there's, there's so, there's such a wide variety of technologies and otherwise available for organizations because we're 24 seven, right? We're worldwide. And so even if you don't have an employee on it at four o'clock in the morning, there's FAQs, there's chatbots, there's technology deployed right and giving people options. It's a phenomenal resource to, um, to help prevent frustration. You know, we talk a lot about the positive side. What can we do to engage? All this is very important. But at the core of it, we're trying to avoid frustration. When somebody's frustrated, they can leave us very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. There is actually uh, the part where customer retention or satisfaction comes in is uh, ignored by so many organizations and which is where, you know, that the first part becomes very successful, but the trailing is like really off. Yeah, and but what's interesting is, is most organizations don't think that they're doing a poor job. And it's not that they don't care. Of course, they care about their customers. Yeah. They just forget that we spend so much time wooing our customers at the beginning. We do so much to attract them. Because you, even when you talk about um, customer acquisition, I don't even think it's acquisition in most cases. I think most people are working with somebody. So our job isn't to acquire. It's, it's not customer acquisition. It's customer conversion. Like we have to convince them to stop doing business the way they're currently and start doing business with us. That's hard. But then once we have them, we have this belief that we're really, really good at this. And so of course they're going to stay and it doesn't work that way because somebody's always trying to pull them away from us. And so the retention part gets less attention and it's not because, and I've heard other people say that we don't care about our customers once we get them. Of course we care about them. We just don't pay so much attention to them. And, you know, you can equate this to a marriage. You know, somebody spends a lot of time wooing their spouse 
and then they've been married for 10 years and they stopped trying. We have to keep, tr we always have to keep trying. We have to keep dating our customers and we keep having to show them how much we appreciate them and cater to them. And, um, and there's ways with people. We're learning so much with technology, how much, I mean, those are some of the big changes during, during the pandemic. And, and it's, it started long before that. Right. How we do business is different. And, and organizations have to be very customer centric. That's true. That's absolutely true. So like we just said that the pandemic, we saw many digital transformations coming, coming in and picking up pace, right? Mm -hmm. So do you think AI and automation will play an important role in creating these memorable customer experience, which can lead to customer retention? Um, well, absolutely. And the good news is it's getting better and better. I mean, that's big data. That's machine learning. Uh, we all know the, the early days of chat bots and things like that is, is most of the questions we have, they didn't quite understand. Right. Or we'd have a question and it, they didn't cover it. Hmm. They're getting smarter uh, all the time. And it's becoming far more conversational. Now, I, I, to be clear, I'm fine with, with technology. I'm actually becoming more fine with it all the time because it's getting better and better. And some of the AI learning is becoming much more conversational as long as there's an option as long as there's an option for a real person. I think organizations who think they can just go technology and that'll take care of the problem, it's almost like saying, hey, you just deal with it. I don't wanna to talk to our customers. You always have to be ready to talk to your customers, but customers want options. So to answer your question, AI, chatbots, absolutely it's become an important part, but only the companies that do it well and yeah. only the, the organizations who adopt the technology who recognize that it's another option for their customers. When we try as organizations, here's one of the challenges, one of the things that drives customers away. When we try to push our customers to do business with us the way we want them to, yeah. they get frustrated. But when we unveil, here's a host of options. If you want an answer at two o'clock in the morning, you can find it here. You can talk to a chat bot. You can click here to talk to a real person if it's during hours. The more options we give them, the more we become remarkably easy to do business with, the easier it is to retain and, and generate loyalty. That's true. That's absolutely right. And um, like people are so driven uh, with the uh, FOMO of getting some smarter technologies that they are not doing it the right way and you know losing out on customers just because they are not being available when the customers are asking for yeah. it. Yeah, well, people get... They get enamored, they get, they get wide-eyed at new technology. And during challenging times, you can't just spend money on technology because it's cool technology. Yeah. It has to solve a problem. Yes. And technology has to solve a problem. And the problem is sometimes we're overwhelmed with customer questions or requests. I get it. We can't necessarily hire unlimited people hmm. uh, because then the economic model doesn't work anymore. Okay. So that's where the balance comes in. So ideally, wait times go down, access to information goes up, options increase, and that becomes a very preferable company. Those are the companies that are going to survive and do well in the future. Not everybody's going to survive. This is very challenging worldwide. Yeah. And no matter when you're watching or listening to this, this is the new reality. You know, you hear a lot about the new normal. The new normal is, is the marketplace has changed. Our customers have changed. You know, I, I, I speak all over the world and, and I work with organizations and I consult and I hear other speakers will say things like, listen, technology changes and the markets will change, but people don't change. And I'm like, are you kidding? We've all changed. We've become so impatient and demanding, mostly because we can, mm. because almost anything we want, we just get it on the phone. Yeah, yeah. I heard a great term. Somebody was talking about the couch economy. And the couch economy is being able to sit at home, ask anything you want of Alexa or Google Home or on your phone. I have my groceries delivered now. It's awesome. I would never have done that before. But, but we've learned we have to. So even as the world opens up again, not everything is going back to the way it was. Yeah. And so the companies that will survive, as I said before, are remarkably easy to do business with. We hear a lot in the customer experience world about creating wow moments. I don't think most companies lend themselves to wow moments. If you're a B2B company and you're selling an electronic component to an electronic parts manufacturer, there's not a lot of wow moments. 
but we can be really easy and we can be intuitive and we can be accessible electronically or otherwise. Yeah. Um, but we have to understand our customers and how their world is changing and make sure we align how we do business to how our changing customer wants to do business with. It sounds simple. It's simple, but it's not easy. Yeah, exactly. Like it's simple, but it's not easy to implement. Yeah, very true, very true. Or, or, to, imp or to implement it well. Mm -hmm. And you know, with, with, with your company as well, that there's other people who do chatbots or AI, just not everybody's doing it well. Right. And so the, yeah. the smart companies are, and the smart companies are solving business problems they're enhancing their customer experience without adding to frustration. That's true, that's true. So do you think that customer behavior has changed in the pandemic? And what would you advise companies that need to align with the new normal like we just discussed? And sure. what would the future hold for our customer experience? Yeah, well, I think that <clears throat> the change started happening a long time ago. What has been, what, 13 years since the iPhone came out? And it kind of started changing everything. Just because our access to information, <coughs> excuse me, our access to information has changed significantly. We don't have to go somewhere and ask somebody to explain it. There's been the shift in the world from selling to buying. Right. And selling, we used, we used to need salespeople to explain products and services and the yeah. features and benefits. Um, sales is st still important. It's just different because now most of that sales process we do ourselves. Yeah. We can look it up online. We can look at the review sites. We can go on the internet. So by the time we talk to companies, we've already, we already know who else is available and we're just kind of looking for the best price or things like that. So that started before, but here's what's changed is that because we were locked down in various countries around the world, we still had to live. And so we learned to do a lot of things virtually. We learned to be able to, and those companies who we could not access information, we got frustrated and left. You yeah. know, we hear a lot about, about companies pivoting. In many cases, it's not a pivot. They're just adopting technologies that were already available. They were just kind of slow to adopt them. Yeah. So, so what's changed is we know that we can do business differently. We can know in this couch economy that we can do a lot. It doesn't mean everything we can, right? We can't get our, you know, our hair done on our app, you know, or things like that. But, but everything else in our life has changed. And here's what I mean. So everybody who's watching or listening, even if you're in a business, our greatest role is consumers. We're all consumers. And we've come to expect things very, very quickly. When a company says, yeah, we're not sure exactly when the delivery will happen. And they go, well, Uber knows. They're exactly here and they'll be here in 12 minutes. Why can't you do that? And it's not a fair comparison or Amazon can deliver overnight soon, you know, by drone in 30 minutes. Why can't you do that? So what's changed is us. And so you were right. And when you talk about how we have to align and what we do is we say, how do people want to reach us? Are we available that way? Do they, I think we're entering an age of extraordinary that will require an extraordinary level of accommodation. Right. The things that we traditionally say no to, we're going to have to start saying yes to, you know, and saying, well, can I, can I get that customized? Yeah, no, no, we don't do that. Or even if we're in a restaurant hmm. and we've got, you know, can I get, can I get shrimp or prawns instead of chicken? No, no substitutions. Why? You know why? Because the waiter or waitress doesn't want to figure it out and the cook doesn't want to do it. And we don't care what they want to do. That's how we want it. And if they say no, then we'll just go somewhere else. And they lose the lifetime value of that customer. Worse yet, they may go online and complain about them. And it doesn't matter if you're B2B or B2C. We have to start considering special requests more than we ever did before, right. just because other people do it. So I think the big change is us as consumers. And the companies that will be flexible and accommodating and simple and intuitive and even remarkable sometimes, right? Even wow moments when they happen, yeah. they'll have a competitive advantage. But if you're doing business the exact same way you did 15 years ago, the world passed you. If you come out of this pandemic doing business the exact same way you did a year ago, you will have wasted this time mm -hmm. to shift and to change and to understand your customers better. That's true, that's true. I, I remember this, that uh, Amazon has its customer experience changed so gradually 
that now everything what we do as a customer experience is we compare it to amazon like it has done it so gradually that we did not understand that they did such a huge change but when we try and compare it to some somebody else who is doing it locally then we see that oh that's a big difference and i would i would do something which is best yeah yeah but and look how frustrating it is for small companies because of course now everybody says well do you give free shipping there is no such thing as free shipping. I mean, free shipping costs something. So it's either built into the price and Amazon, of course, they can divide it up and do it in volume. Right, right. But it's really challenging for small business owners because they can say it's not fair to compare to Amazon. And we say, okay, it doesn't matter if it's fair. I mean, it just, we've just learned that we can get things sort of when we want. I remember even in the early days of, of DVRs and things like that and, and recording TV, my, my son, when he was very, very small, um, we, were, we were, I don't know, we were watching TV in some place and he says, dad, pause it. And I said, well, this TV doesn't pause. He had no idea what that, I grew up, you didn't pause TV. You paused yourself. Yeah. You didn't talk. You just talked during the commercials, right? Because if you missed it, you missed it. Yeah, yeah. The, they're growing up in a different world, but here's what's interesting. People will blame millennials and they're like, we're all like that now because we're living in the same world. We kind of want what we want. I joke that I could walk into almost anybody's house, walk into their kitchen, look at their microwave oven, and it's at like two seconds, right? Because you couldn't wait those last two. It's like five, four, oh, you're done. Come on, right? We're all so impatient. Like no, nobody waits till the microwave gets down to zero. It's like, oh, you're but it's yeah. everybody, it's not just millennials. And so um, I ask companies all the time when I'm consulting and others, I said, how much of your process, how much of what you do is optimized for speed, for speed of delivery? If everything's the same and we got lots of choices, whoever right. can get it to me faster, when I'm going on Amazon and I need something maybe for my recording studio or something, cause I do a lot of virtual presentations. If something says they can get it to me tomorrow and something is even a little bit less expensive, but I have to wait three days, I'll just get the one that, that tomorrow. Yeah. Like that was the only difference. The other one was even a little bit cheaper. Yeah, but I want it now. Mm. That's the world today. Yeah. So how many organizations like during the pandemic and others have looked inward and looked at their process? Here's how we do everything and say, could that be, could that be, could we speed that up? Mm. Could that be done better or faster or smarter or more, more memorably? Can we reduce points of friction where somebody says no or something's inflexible? or we, we finally get somebody to the website and then there's no way to, they, they make a fill out a, a contact form. There's no immediate ac access to answers, whether it's an AI chatbot, whether it's a phone number, whether it's something, if people can't get immediate, I wouldn't call it gratification, answers, just immediate answers in some way, electronic or otherwise, they're gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're gone. Yeah. You know, we, I, I, I like to say if, if that, um, that contact forms are voicemail of the internet. When you call a company and they, and they want you to leave a, a voice message, you don't leave a voice, you just call the next one. Mm. Call yeah. the next one, you know. Yeah. If you're, sorry, I'm not in the office, leave a message. I'm not gonna leave a message because I don't know when they're gonna call me back. Yeah. Contact forms do the same thing. Yes. My gosh, at least have a chat feature, at least if it's after hours, have a chat bot with great AI learning so that it can be intuitive and it's not just a list of FAQs. That's where technology, and it's getting better and better, and it's a really exciting future for what it can be, as long as we don't force people to use it. Yes, Just yes. Make, it, make it an option. Hmm. That's true. So along with this behavior, like we just discussed, that their yeah. expectations have also changed. So um, what exactly do they want from the companies to do, and how do companies cope up with this thing? Well, well, there's a couple of things. Number one is they have to match to whatever extent that they can, the convenience um, and the accommodation. We have to say yes more often. We have to be able to be accessible. But there's certain things that bigger companies can do that, that, that we can't. They can do lower prices because they make it up in volume. <clears throat> but there's a level of personalization that smaller companies can do that big companies just can't. And what I'll hear other people do, I'll, I'll speak to like a CEO group and they'll say, well, those guys, they don't care about special orders. They don't care about the little guy. Come on, of course they care. They just don't have a business model that supports it. So what's your, oppor your opportunity is to be more personalized because you can. 
they got a big company to run and they can't change everything all the time. It doesn't make sense. But when you're small and nimble, <coughs> we, can, <coughs> we can get on the phone, we can go on site, we can do special requests, we can do accommodations, we can um, create different internal experiences if you're a, if you're a retail customer. Um, they can see it and touch it and feel it that maybe they can't do for something online or overseas. But part of it is doing an exercise of saying, who are our major competitors? What do they do well? What can we match? What, what can we not match? But what can we do that they can't? Just because it doesn't make sense economically for them to do. It's not that they don't care. It's just not their model. Right. So there's some really creative things that companies can do because at the end of the day, you want people to talk about you in a positive way. And this was sort of the impetus for the shift in my business. I talked marketing and branding for 20 years and I was helping organizations better describe themselves and help people understand what makes them different and better and preferable. But I sort of came to the, the, the realization over the years that while what companies say about themselves is important, what other people say about them is even more important. And that wasn't true 10 years ago, but it's very important today. So part, and that's what sort of drove, you know, the new book, Why Customers Leave, was I started, I was helping companies drive a lot of traffic and customers, and then they would frustrate them and lose them. And I'm like, what are we doing here? And so we went about in the research, identifying things that frustrate customers. The companies didn't realize they were doing wrong because it made sense. We've got a good business model. We can, we can plan our customer's path. They start here, they research. They can order and customize and pay, and here's where you follow up, and it works. Here's the problem. Your customers haven't read your employee manual. They don't know how they're supposed to do business with you. They just know how they want to do business with you. And so I was recognizing that so much of the behavior that we show affects what people think about us. It affects what they buy, whether they leave, and whether they go online and complain about us, and that never goes away. And so what companies can do is become more customer centric. And, and it doesn't mean customer focused. Everybody's customer focused. Customer centric is different. It just means we're all really good at what we do, but we're really good at understanding our customers and what they like and what they need and what frustrates them and what their time constraints are and who they need permission from and all of that as well. And so sometimes to answer your question, I know it's a long answer, is what can smaller companies do is recognize, and this takes time, have a long staff meeting, bring in a, a consultant or something to say, what can we do that they can't or that they won't or it doesn't make sense for them? What can we do that our customers would appreciate? But too many companies don't. They just put their head down and they work really hard at being good at what they do, and that's important. But, um, but sometimes different is, is important. Right? What 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 can you do that they can't? That's how you that's how you start conversation. That's how you get people talking. And then of course, like we started at the beginning, we got to make sure we don't frustrate the customers that we already have. That that would really help, yeah. Yeah. So concluding, are there any other thoughts that you would like to share with the audience? Uh, I think it's just the the realization that if everybody's waiting for things to get back to normal, um, or at least the way they used to be, they aren't but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Not everybody's gonna survive this, but a lot of companies are gonna get stronger. And those who really take the time to recognize what's changing with their customers and how they wanna do business and resist the frustration of saying, well, I'm not gonna do that just because they want, it doesn't mean everybody, calm down, recognize that, that everybody's expectations are changing and there's an opportunity to redesign your business in a way that, um, that really is aligned with how they want to buy. I mean, how many companies have really shifted to more um, electronic based and virtual and things? It doesn't mean everything that we do, but we, but we have to accommodate more and more. And so the world is different. That's not necessarily a bad thing long-term. And the companies that will survive, there's an opportunity to do some really great things. I think history will record this as a time of remarkable innovation. Because we've been challenged, we've been challenged to overcome these problems. And from that comes great new technology and new approaches and new mindset. And so I think it's a very, very exciting time in business. It's certainly a challenging time worldwide, but I think that the ones who get afraid 
and, and look inward and try and protect what they have are missing some of the great opportunities that are out there. That's true. That's absolutely true. So thank you so much, David, for giving us your time. I think the insights that you have shared and the examples that you have shared for increasing customer experience and retention, uh, those are very valuable. And I think the audience is really going to enjoy this interview. Good. Thank you very much. And feel free, anybody wants to look me up, just look me up at David at David, or my email is david at davidaverin.com. Just look me up online and you can see, uh, see who I am and what I do. That sounds great. So we'll be back with a new episode with a brand new expert soon. So stay tuned and we'll see you around for the next one. Goodbye.